The Veterans Advocacy Training Program for this session is a review of the VA claims process. Alina Swanson is a retired benefits specialist who represented veterans all the way up uh, as far as you can go uh, and is, has a large background in this area. We are at Coffee Strong right now, so I will file a disclaimer that you will hear sounds of uh, coffee making in the background. And we're real pleased to be here at Coffee Strong in Lakewood, Washington, where you will see GIs coming in through fatigues, but that also uh, encourages us as we realize that some of these soldiers will be leaving with problems. And that's where we, as veterans advocates, uh, will step in and help them file VA claims. So I'm going to start off, uh, Lena, and just have you cover some of the issues of um, applying for benefits. What, what, what is that? For benefits? Yes, for VA benefits. A service-connected disability benefit is a, any physical or mental condition incurred on active duty or aggravated by active duty that may have lasting effects. You'll hear that over and over and over again. You should, you should uh, bury it deep in your, your psyche and don't forget it. Those lasting That effects. may have may lasting have. And that could be 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Well, yes, it can be. But they, they, uh, I would like to ask some of the students some questions if they remember what we've been through. Do you remember what a presumptive period is? From what? From discharge. Okay. A presumptive, uh, the, one of the responses was when I asked is I would one say year from discharge. That's 365 days from discharge. What does that mean? Um, the presumptive period? Uh -huh. what it is means it? that if any um, uh, uh, disability or injury or disease occurs within that time, it's presumed that disability or injury or disease came from the service of the veteran. Okay, she's, uh, she is saying that, that you mentioned injury, uh, that the presumptive oh, period, the first 365 days, if it is not, if the condition is not in your service medical records, and you develop the symptoms of a chronic condition, like diabetes, high blood pressure, this type of thing, the condition need not have been in your service medical records. In fact, it need not have been diagnosed within that first 365 days, but you must have been being treated for the symptoms of whatever it is that was later diagnosed. You must show that. The, that's, a, that's something that people overlook as the years go by. Uh, filing a claim immediately upon discharge is important because you normally uh, that starts the clock ticking by the way that's the 365 days from discharge when you file your and that claim. veteran can file that on his or her own uh, self but yes. should if uh, any time that they're filing get uh, help from claims agents? Well, now this is what I have normally said. You truly don't need a service representative in the beginning if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, I encourage you to seek out one of the service organizations or one of the state agencies or better still, one of the independent claims agents that we are going to be producing here and allow them to assist you in preparing the claim. Uh, now, they would not need to file an official document. They could actually go over to the informal claim? Well, they can write a letter to the VA and say, I intend to file a claim for these conditions. Uh, the paperwork will be forthcoming. That sets up the deadline of the, uh, that sets up the, the clock because you're protecting the effective date of any award granted if by getting that informal claim and in date stamped in by the VA because any service connected disability award is effective the first day of the month following date of receipt of the claim 
Okay, state that again, because we're talking about the effective date. The effective date. The date that the VA is going to pay you. I mean, the effective date is the first day of the month following the date they receive the claim. In other words, if you file on February 24th then and, a, and a, an award is granted, the, uh, the award date is March 1st. And of course, they're always behind, uh, they're 30 days behind, so they won't get any money until the end of the March. So, so that's what's important. Will they get March's payment though? When yes, they, do they get would. There? Yes, they would. So if you file a claim and it takes a year for them to process it, the first payment would, and, and you have an effective date back to when you did file, mm -hmm. that first payment would include the retroactive? That is correct. That is correct. So it goes back to that first month after? The first day of the month following the date they following filed. Following the date the that they filed. Now, if you want to lead me through this, I'd it'd be. That's fine. Yeah, no, good. You go keep, ahead. No, no. Go ahead. When do they uh, consider uh, completing the VA Form 21526 then? They should do that immediately. I mean, if, if you've put the VA on notice that you're going to be filing a claim, uh, then do that as soon as possible. Usually within 30 days, you get that in there with your discharge papers and all the supporting documents. Now, Lena, this is, you uh, know, for the viewing audience, uh, this is a, an actual form that you would go to the, the VA online and you can download form 21 526. Right. And you want to scare the people to say how long this is? Well, it's about 24 pages, and what I basically do is destroy the first few pages. But if I was a veteran and not knowing what, if you have to, as a, as a person going to file a claim, if you have to go down here and read this stuff, then go to the service officer and let them do it for you. But And ahead. you mentioned service officers, so why don't you touch bases as to what a service officer is in case okay. people do not know. Uh, d disabled American veterans, veterans of foreign wars, American Legion, and vets, Vietnam vets of America, and now, of course, Iraq and Afghanistan. What is that, AVA? IVA. IVA? Yeah. And I don't know if they, I don't know if they have established service officers or not. But all of these service organizations have chapters out in the community of volunteer service officers. There are 58, and take note, there are 58 VA regional offices in the United States. I think there are three in New York. Uh, there are, there are two in New York. No, there, this, there are two in New York. There are two in Texas, maybe three in California. How many is that? That's five. It's five there. Then the other, th the other three are in New York. So in the state of Washington, where we're located in Lakewood, Washington, just outside the gates of uh, Joint yes. Base McCord, Fort mm -hmm. Lewis there, uh, we would be going to Seattle then, where the RO, Correct. as we use the, the regional so office. Regional Correct. office. Let me ask you, if you're in eastern Washington, do you also go to Seattle? Or your, your, your paperwork is handled at the federal building by the VA regional office. They very well may call you into the Spokane VA hospital for their comp and pension exam. And by the way, now this is what, 2010? There's a lot of contracting going on, contracting out. The VA is contracting out these comp and pension exams to private physicians all over the country where they used to be brought in. Uh, for their comp and pension exams. And the veteran needs to remember that the only thing that that, only items that that comp and pension doctor can look at are the items that you're claiming. They can't, you can't come in with all these complaints. He's only there to evaluate what you have filed on. Now in a previous session, Lena, we, we had the session on interviewing, which is also Correct. out on uh, Blip TV. Correct. And we interviewed uh, a person who is presently in the service and then right. one who is a retired uh, army. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we were helping that person or telling this person to fill that out, would they go through this as, as thoroughly as possible? Absolutely. If you have access, you know, it's recommended heavily, if you have access to the veterans uh, service medical records, it is recommended that you go through them and, and study them closely. Now I've got a v, I've got a Merck manual in my car. I've got a uh, a Cecil's medical textbook, two of them, volume two volumes of it in my car. 
I've got a dictionary, medical dictionary in my car. So when you're reviewing a service medical record, you are looking, and if you need to stop and look up what a word means and do so. But when I reviewed records, the first thing I did was open it up to the lab reports. I'm looking for abnormal readings, the blood sugar readings, of urinary readings, anything that looks abnormal, it's outside of the normal. And normally they'll have three columns in the lab report. Normal. So you're not just taking the word of what the veteran says oh, their no. current issue oh, is no. or what they're experiencing. You're looking through the entire Absolutely. document. Absolutely. The idea, the idea is to get that veteran, by the way, before he gets out, before he takes his separation physical exam, go through those medical records before he takes that separation exam because the VA looks very heavy at that what you say on those exams. So here at Coffee Strong we see a lot of uh, present-day yes. uh, soldiers uh -huh. uh, coming through mm -hmm. who are getting ready to exit the service right. and um, what we could suggest to the coffee baristas here is to get a hold of their present uh, military records, all Correct. their health records, everything Correct. so that they Correct. have a, a copy of those. Yes, absolutely. And go through them before he takes his exit physical. And many times you walk into the, the doctor's office, the veteran will walk into the doctor's office and he'll say, how you doing? And the vet will say, I'm doing fine. Yeah. And the day before, his back was bothering him because he was doing a lot of bending and stooping and lifting, but he, he rested well last night. He didn't bother to say that this is a reoccurring pain or that he had twisted his knee uh, a couple of weeks before and the knee was bothering him. Those kind of things should be on that. They've got little checkoff lists on that, on that separation exam. And you check everything, every time you've had a problem, whether it was a runny nose or what, you check it off. Because that forces the military to look at those conditions. Regardless of whether they find anything or not, you have indicated your, uh, your, your uh, problem. It's important. And then when you go into the, uh, uh, when you get out of the military, uh, you have somebody go through the medical records for you, again, uh, with that separation exam in, on top, and they're going through it looking for any abnormalities that may have occurred. Now, in the beginning, if you go, if you're if you're not feeling well and you're on active duty, you go into the foreman or the medic, and they'll list your complaint. Very first thing, they'll list the complaint of the veteran. They put the date over here on the left. Uh, then they will. Uh, the second portion will show lab reports or what they ordered. Uh, not necessarily the results of the lab reports, but they, what they ordered. And the third one will be impression or diagnos uh, diagnosis. And that's what you're looking for when you're looking, uh, when you're reviewing those medical records. You're looking for that diagnosis or the impression. So that record or records could be inches thick if a person's been in there for 10, 15 years or so. Oh, really? And you know, the sad part about it is most of the men don't want to be couch potatoes or what do you call it? Those sick bay dudes that uh, would go to sick bay rather than go to uh, out to the field. Many of them won't complain. Many of them live with their discomfort. You know, in our earlier tapings, we recommended that you, what is that, uh, the, that, that video, that series of 10, um, that, uh, World War II? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, brothers? No. Band of brothers. Band of brothers. You know, I encourage all of you in the TV audience as well, and those of you in the room, to review that. And why I want you to review that is after, after this training, you will watch these men in combat and see how they're, they're carrying all this weight. They're diving for cover. They're diving into uh, foxholes. They're diving into ditches. You know, and they're falling. Uh, they, they're busy trying to survive. They're not thinking about, oh, I'm going to hurt my leg or I hurt my back. They're just trying to keep moving. Now, years later down the road, when the arthritis sets in, they don't make a comparison to what happened to them on active Well, and today, uh, the average soldier serving in Iraq and Afghanistan has body armor as well as the other type of things in their pack, which is uh, conversant with what their MOS would be. And sometimes that can almost equal their body weight. Well, the, the one that we interviewed, he said, uh, the, 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 the medic said that his, with his medical supplies and his body armor and his backpack and his ammunition supplies, 150 pounds. 
And I don't know if he weighed 150 pounds or not. He was a little bit on the thin side. Very, very important. And remember that the VA cannot read your mind. So when you're screening the veteran, you are taking him from top to bottom. You're going over that, you're going over those medical records. And you're not only dealing with him physically, you're dealing with him emotionally. Especially those with combat experience. Um, those who were medics that had to pick up the wounded had to, uh, I told you about the one, the chief that, that had been assigned to the Marine Corps in Vietnam and they were caught out in the bush and this one guy was shot and he was dying. And so the, the poor one stayed behind to help him, uh, to be with him. And he heard the Viet Cong coming, and so he took out his gun and shot him, killed him, because he knew that death was imminent for this vet anyway. But he lived with that. He lived with that, that, that guilt all these years until he walked into my office one day and told me. He hadn't told another living soul. So you don't know what that veteran is, is coming into you with. You don't know what kind of package they're carrying. Well, in addition to these medical records that, mm -hmm. that they uh, get for you, mm -hmm. that they can write off for, mm -hmm. and we'll put that on the uh, on the uh, television uh, where they can uh, get that right. address there. Um, you also interview and we recommend to all the people in the class to interview the veterans to get a rounded picture and you say from head to toe. Where does that come in in filling out this uh, form? Before you even start the form, you've got a blank tablet sitting beside you. And I truly encourage the wife to be present or the spouse to be present when this interview is going on. Uh, but before you start filling this out, you've gone through the service medical records, you've written down what you think is important. Then you go back over it. Uh, yeah. for, yes. I say, you also made the point about when you're interviewing the veterans, like the combat veterans, uh -huh. uh, not to probe too far unless you have counselors available. Well, it, it, what I've always said is to be very, very careful because the protective wall that these these men have put up, uh, it has saved them. Uh, if you break it down, you have to have something supportive to put in its place immediately. And here in the state of Washington, and I understand it's now available through many states, the state of Washington Department of Veterans Affairs has post-traumatic stress counselors strategically located throughout the state that the veteran can uh, uh, seek help, counseling, and guidance with. Now, I had one when I was in Bremerton. There was one over in Port Orchard. I could get him to him immediately. Um, yeah, but yes, you have to be very careful when dealing with that emotional situation. And some of the men are angry. You've got to remember that. They come home angry. Uh, they're, been, what is it that turned, what, uh, uh, anger turned outward is what inside? Depression or? Okay. They, they didn't get time to grieve over, over a buddy that was killed. Or they felt guilty because there was a kid killed in the, in, the, in, the, in the attack that they were on. These are young men that had never seen the violence of war. And what we did, we sent young men over who came back, young men in, with old men heart. They took, we took away their idealism. We took away their, their, their uh, the glee, the, the vigor for life in their minds. They came back angry. They didn't know what for. And here in Olympia, Washington, we'll probably see an increase of returning veterans from the two wars. Uh, Joint Base uh, McCord Lewis sent 10,000 troops to both Afghanistan and to Iraq. And it's been estimated, probably very, very conservatively, that 30% of these um, soldiers will have problems with PTSD, let alone traumatic brain injury and some of the others. Let's go on though to, uh, they've completed this form as best they can and we as claims agents help complete this form, but it's now what is referred to as the VA duty to notify. What does that mean? Okay, if we, we've sent them in the informal notice, right, that we're going to file with 526 that's coming yeah, in. Yeah, and you sent that in to the RO. The regional, regional office. office. Never abbreviate when you're dealing with right. an unknown audience. So the VA regional office nearest you. 
the now what did you ask me the VA uh, duty to notify okay there's an intake uh, at the federal building in the VA regional office they get this letter in now this is best I can recall they get this this claim in. They have to date stamp everything. They set up a file. They check to see if there's ever been a file on this guy. If there isn't, they set a new one up. Then they go through what he has attached. You know, and sad to say, even if everything is on here, if even if everything is attached, all the evidence, all the all the marriage certificates, all the divorce decrees, all the birth certificates, all the private medical, even if it's all attached, and the DD 214s, they're still going to send out this letter saying, "Here's what we need." Uh, and, and that's saying what they need to obtain evidence. Right, that, right, and yet we may have already sent it out. Yeah. But when they do that, it, it's going to delay the claim. It's going to delay the process because that file is not going anywhere until they get a response back. And what every veteran needs to know is if you get a letter back from the VA, you respond to it immediately within 30 days. 30 days is that time period? Yes. Okay. And you say, I've already sent it all in. Uh, please refer to the file for further information. If you need more information, contact me. Now, when, when the uh, person rece receives this um, letter from the VA, mm -hmm. That is an official form, and they, they would include a form inside there, most likely? No. No, they don't. No, they're sending you a letter. It's going to be several pages. Okay. And they're telling you what they need, the kind of information they need. Now, I encourage the veteran to set up uh, either a binder, a three-ring binder, or a, man, a manila folder with the VA information on one side, correspondence on one side, and your information on the other side. Put it under ACO Fastener, with the latest date always being on top. So if you get in an inquiry from the VA, all you got to do is open your file and you see their latest inquiry and you see your latest response. You are responsible. If you are the service agent, if you are the claims agent, you will be setting up a file also. Uh, the, what I tell, what I told my clients is never, never send anything to the VA that you don't keep a copy of. And if it's not on VA letterhead with your name on it, the benefit doesn't exist. Don't believe what people tell you. Uh, don't believe what you hear over the telephone. The sad part is that the toll-free line, the 1-800-827-1000, that's a toll-free VA line. And the people on the other end of the phone are supposed to be able to have answers for you and be able to direct you sad part they're in training most of them not only that but now they used to, Seattle used to answer its own phones 827 in the state of Washington it would answer directly into the regional office that's not the case anymore they farmed it out there's some in Albuquerque there's some in uh, in uh, Oklahoma City I don't know where all they all are but I called up one day and they didn't even know who the secretary of the VA was and that's General Sin Eric Shinseki they didn't know who he was uh, but, so don't believe what you hear. When in doubt, check it out. If you are the claims agent, you keep your benefits manual and you keep your laws and regulations up to date and you keep them close by. Anytime you have a question, and keep your reference material close by. The beautiful thing that has come about since I retired is so much of it is on computer now. You can reach it through the computer. Now, they, they were, will ask you uh, to obtain the following evidence to substantiate the, the claim that you're making. Uh, one area that they can go to is the National Personnel Records Center because sometimes the veteran may not have a complete set of medical records. They should have, but they may not have. And uh, there you're going to request uh, pertaining to military records. You can get a complete setback as I understand it. Yes, you can. But bear in mind the VA will also be going after those records. However, in all likelihood, uh, you, you could probably get them faster mm. than the VA can. Remember, every time the VA has to go out for information, it's going to slow your claim down. So if you get an official copy of your service medical records from the National Personnel Records Center, do not alter it. Do not change a page in it. Do not add to it. Do not take anything out. You keep it all together. You attach it to your claim. 
and you forward it in because it is an official document. So anything, if it's tampered with, it destroys the whole thing. So you can submit a copy of that or you have to submit the original? You keep, you keep a copy. They're going to send you a copy. They're not going to send you the original. Right. Now, starting in about 1995, 96, the, uh, the military services started sending the original medical record to the VA archives mm -hmm. in uh, Washington, D.C. or somewhere. Uh, now I don't know if that's still the case because you see what's true today may not be true tomorrow. They're trying everything, trying to speed this process up. Uh, so I don't know where it is. I don't know where they are. But I think the VA has the originals well, and they will be going after them. I think what I read when I was doing some of the studying is since the VA, the VA has these records, they've gone to the National Archives, which is the repository for all of them. Right. They've gone to the National Archives. The VA has control of them, however, rather than the National Personnel Records Center. And they, they will, when asked, requ requested by the VA, they will forward the original service medical records to this claim that has just been set up. Okay? Now, the, the VA will issue a decision letter at the regional office area. Tell us about those decision letters and how many actually were said, oh, you're right, here's what they're eligible okay. for, how many were um, Well, let me, you, you, you jumped the gun a little okay. bit. Okay. When, when the veteran files the claim, and, he's, and, the, file is, and the claim is made up, uh, and everything is in order, assuming he filed within that first year, mm -hmm. uh, they will notify him to report somewhere for a physical exam. Now note this, uh, for the TV audience and for those of you here, the VA can accept the private medical record that the veteran submits as its comp and pension exam, if they so choose. It's rare, but it's possible. Uh, but they will bring the veteran in for an exam, either contracted out or to the locus nearest VA medical facility. The, uh, the, the Examining physicians, and you want to make note of this, the examining physician at the VA is not always a doctor. It may be a physician's assistant if that, or a nurse practitioner. If that is the case and you have submitted private medical by an MD, mm -hmm. that means that your medical evidence is weight or is heavier than, than the examination results of this, this is the physician's assistant. They are so desperate for help. So it's recommended then that the veteran get private medical uh, documentation as much as possible prior to the calling well, into the medical exam? Not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. Only if you get an unfavorable decision do you go back mm. and challenge. But the, uh, here's what's going to happen. The, once the doctor, the reviews, he looks, at, he looks at what the veteran is claiming. Bad back, the bad knees, the headaches, the bad elbows or whatever. Now, especially on joints, they must do a range of motion test and pain on motion <coughs> test on the knees, on the back, and what many veterans are not aware of is that the minute that starts to hurt, he's supposed to tell the examiner that it's hurting. It hurts when I lift it this far. How many times does the guy, you know, being the macho dude that he is, will go ahead and pull, you know, way beyond the point where he should have stopped? Uh, there is a, there, there, there was, I don't know if it's still in existence or not, uh, a rule that you pain on motion and range of, limited range of motion could not be combined. It had to be rated separately. But there's not a regulation on pain. So I don't know what has happened on, on that regulation. But in any event, so the, the physician completes his examination, right? And he gives his impression. And then he ships it back to the VA regional office where this file is located. The rating, the VA rating specialist. Now let me pre-note this. When I first began to work for the VA, for the state of Washington, in uh, 19, when I, 1976, 
the, the excuse me the dog barking in the background is a service dog belonging bet. to one of our veterans and so uh, it's all right for Shotzi to make the noise it's okay now where was it yeah uh, so now we have the, the, the veteran's claim, what he's claiming is wrong with him. We have the examiner's results. We have the service medical records. So he's got to look through those three areas and mix them all together and come up with a resolution. Then he has to go to the, the rules and regulations, chapter four. Uh, to determine what percentage this veteran should get for each condition. There are diagnostic codes for each condition. And this is where a service agent, is, a claims agent, is it's very important because the errors that are being made today are so great. Uh, sometimes they'll put the wrong diagnostic code on the, wrong, on the condition. That's a clear and unmistakable error especially if the diagnostic code above it would have been a higher rating. And I've, I've encountered that in my years. Well, and later we'll be talking about these Q claims, the oh, yeah, clear, the clear and unmistakable, unmistakable errors. But, but on, uh, if you would look, you know, those of you who have access to the VA uh, computers, I mean, the access to computers, online. online computers, you can go and find these, con these percentages and it goes by alphabet. You can go look it up the shoulder pain or whatever it is, and then it goes by diagnostic code. So if you have, if you know the diagnostic code but don't uh, don't know the condition, you look up the diagnostic code and it'll tell you what it is. Then you go internally to the book. Now this is what this rating specialist is having to do. Uh, I was going to tell you that in the beginning, when I first started to work for the VA, the the rating board had a doctor, an attorney and a rating specialist on board. And they, the three of them made the decision. As time went by, the attorney disappeared. As more time went by, the doctor disappeared. And all you had left was a VA rating specialist. And consequently, some of these rating specialists adjudicated the claims on their own without getting an outside medical opinion to determine you know, whether or not this the claim was correct or not. Uh, so errors were made. But diagnostic codes are important. I was going to give you one. Where are we? Okay. Let's talk about. Uh, Miscellaneous diseases, no, I don't want them. The migraine headaches, migraine headaches. What page are you on? I'm on uh, 38 CFR 4.124, it's page 832 in the 2009 edition of the Rules and Regulations. Look closely at it, those of you who have that available to them. It, the diagnostic code for migraines is 8100. And over to the right are the percentages that are going to be awarded based upon the review of the service medical records. It's 832, page 832. Based upon the review of the service medical records, based upon the review of the examination, and based upon the veteran's claim. And in order for the veteran to, and the highest rating for a migraine, it says here, is 50%. The next high is 30 then it drops down to 10, and then it drops down to 10%, uh, and then to zero. Uh, with very frequent, completely prostating and prolonged attacks, productive of service economic inadaptability is 50%. Now that, that takes a lot of consideration, you know, because they're saying that, wait a minute, he's not able to work? If he's not able to work, I'd, 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 I'd look hard at that. With characteristic prostating attacks occurring on an average of once a month over last several months, that's 
uh, so the, the the diagnostic code and to the, is to the to the left, and the percentage of disability is to the right, and the degrees are, are separated. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Now, when he gets done, now in the past, back before I retired, uh, the rating specialist could not send out that final decision until it was reviewed by a supervisor. Now, when I was forced to retire in 2002, the VA was over 350,000 claims behind nationwide. Today, there are almost a million claims behind, according to CBS 60 Minutes. The, uh, uh, I didn't believe that until I heard Mr. Carpenter last week. The mistakes that are being made the CBS 60 Minutes said there were one out of four claims had major errors made by the VA in them. But back there then, when I was involved in it, like I said, it, an inexperienced rating specialist, the condition being that the rating had to be reviewed before the decision could be mailed out. Today, they're bringing these rating specialists online, my understanding is, within one year. It used to take two years training. I don't know if there's a supervisor reviewing that or not, but the the errors are, are great. They truly are. Now, I'll give you a good example. Uh, when my husband and I went out to breakfast the other morning, there was a, a man and his wife sitting behind us. I didn't recognize them. They were older. He was a Vietnam vet, apparently, and she was too. He said that when I got up to leave, he said, are you Lena Swanson? I said, yes. He said, well, and he told me the last time he had seen me was in 1989 when he had brought his wife in to file a claim for PTSD. Uh, I had the Vietnam uh, mementos on my wall. Some of the guys had given me the river boats, the, uh, the, and I had, had them framed up on my wall. She said, his wife said that he had turned absolutely white. And she looked at me, and so I took a claim for both of them. Now he's getting 100% service connected today for, for uh, PTSD. She's only getting 50%, and yet she takes electrical shocks every week. I said, when's the last time you had your claim upgraded? And she said, never. So that tells me, see, that, that they're not getting the word. I don't know whether, I don't know how to get that word out to these people, that if it's been that long a time, you should go back and recheck your benefits. But in any event, so now we have the decision made by the rating specialist and it is going out in the mail to the veteran. That's the decision letter. From, that is the decision letter from, from, the, from the VA. Okay. And they are supposed, this letter is supposed to uh, explain whether or not they are going to grant the benefits that you are asking. You know, that you're not asking for percentages, you're asking for service-connected disability. And how often is that favorable for the veteran first time around? It varies. It varies. It truly does. It depends on how well that claim is put together. I say to you, as as rating, as uh, claims agents, future claims agents, you're going. You could win or lose your case based upon how well your claim is prepared going in, because you're preparing it as though it's going to go all the way to the court of appeals. That means you put, you've got everything in there. If they come back, if the VA comes back and denies your claim for disability. Uh, that's where the appeal process starts. But let me caution you about something. The longer you wait to file a claim, the more difficult it is to establish service connection. So you're, you're discharged, right? You go to work, you didn't file within that first year after you got out, but you did have problems in the military. And now down the road, you've got the backache, you've got the bad legs and you knew that you were treated for them on active duty, so you come in to, to a claims agent and you want to file a claim. The problem is, now you have to establish medical continuity. Continuity, if you don't want to know what it means, look it up in the dictionary. But it's a continuing complaint. Uh, now the best, if you did not go to a doctor, the best uh, evidence you can get is, is buddy statements from people, number one, who served with you in the military, from the spouse, from your employers who have heard you complain about your knees and your backs. Then you go to a doctor. Before you file your claim, you go to a doctor and have your joints x-rayed. 
Before you do that, however, you sit down and write a letter to whom it may concern. Now, you're the veteran. And remember, the VA can't read your mind, so you're going to have to draw them a picture. I was assigned to such and such company. This is what I was doing uh, on such and such a date. But you don't have to give the date necessarily. But this is how I hurt myself. And be very explicit. Be very, uh, this was my commanding officer. Uh, I was stationed over here during that period of time. And uh, I was seen at the hospital. Normally, the veteran's service medical records will follow him everywhere he goes. But if you're hospitalized overnight in a military hospital, they, they also keep their records. The nurses' notes and this type of thing are not, do not travel with the service medical records. So you may have to go back after those nurses' notes. But in any event, you, you write a statement so that the doctor you're going to see can relate to what you're saying. Maybe it's your treating physician. He knows you've got arthritis in your back and your knee. He said, Doc, here's what happened to me. Is it possible that my problems today could be related to what happened to me in the service? The doctor needs to sit down and, and write a letter. I am familiar with John Doe's condition, with his physical condition. Uh, I have seen the x-rays. He is, has degenerative joint disease of the knees and the back. In my, prof and I have read the veteran statement, and I have seen the buddy statements. In my professional opinion, it is as likely as not these conditions are a direct result of what happened to him on active duty. As likely as not are buzzwords. More likely than not, they're buzzwords. So it's important that you memorize those words. And you may very well have to write the medical statement for the doctor. Now, he may rewrite it, but he needs to know what the VA needs to know. Now, the, those statements are the ones that are going in on the, the 256 form. The 526 the form. The 526 form, yes. 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 But if the letter comes back, the decision letter saying denied, okay. then we're going on to that step, well, what do I do now? And that gets to the area of the notice of disagreement Correct. where we may still need those medical statements from the uh, private doctor? No. No? No, you've got it on file already and they have disregarded it. If they have denied the condition uh, as service related, then you file a notice of disagreement immediately. You've got a year. What should it include? You're telling them that you're not happy with their decision, that you feel that they, uh, that they have uh, uh, they didn't, they weren't, they didn't do it right. You want a review. You want a decision review by a DRO. A decision review officer is somebody who is capable of overturning that initial decision. Will that be at the local level yes, in this case like Seattle? Yes. Yeah, One I, of the 58 offices. Yes. You want to keep your claim as local as possible. You don't want to go to the Board of Veterans Appeals if you have, if you can avoid it. But you ask for a decision re in this notice of disagreement. This is why I disagree with your findings. I'm asking for an independent review by a decision review officer. So the, it, yeah. when you say, this is why I disagree, uh, are you arguing medical terms or simply saying, I don't believe you consider the evidence correct? I just say I disagree with your, with your denial. I submitted the evidence. I was heard on active duty. I've, I've submitted a medical report that shows the continuity. I don't understand why you are denying my claim. But uh, in any event, I want a dis independent review. So this is a fairly short letter as far as... Uh, it can be It can be several pages. Okay. Because you're going to set up several things. Number one, you're asking for an independent review by a decision review officer who's capable of overturning the initial decision. If, if the DRO upholds the local rating, the local denial, then you're going to ask for a personal hearing at the VA regional office. This is where you, the, as claims agents, you're truly going to be important because you're going to prepare your veteran for uh, an oral uh, presentation and you're going to submit him or her to the questions by the VA. So what you as agents will do is do your research Get your law to back you up. Go through those. Go through the codes. Go through the uh, rules and regulations, 
and if necessary, look up court cases under the U.S. Court of Veterans Appeals. You can find them online to back you up. Lena, when does uh, the veteran or the claims agent receive um, the statement of the case? When you're asking for it, if they, if, if they deny, yes. if the decision review officer continues the denial, they are obligated to send you a statement of the case. And what is the statement? Is this even before the review, uh, asking for the review? No, this no. is after the review. Oh, this is after the review. After the DRO, okay. because uh, he can change that decision. Are okay, you so let, let me get the, <coughs> uh, sort of the timeline down there. Um, you help the veteran file the uh, I disagree type of right. a letter. Right, And then that review officer has the authority to overturn the VA's uh, decision. That's correct. Okay. And if they do, great. If they don't, then we are asking for a statement of the claim. Well, you know, this, it, it could go both ways. You can ask for the statement of the case and the VA will immediately send you one. Mm. Then you have the decision review and if they continue to, to uphold the VA, they have to come back and give you a supplemental statement of the case. So I just assume wait until until the uh, DRO has reviewed the case and get the whole thing. So but the statement of the case is almost like saying what cards are you holding in your hand to to deny? The statement of the case, the VA has to explain to you the laws, the regulations under which they made those decisions, why they made those decisions. And by the way, going back, you know, so his examination was by a physician's assistant, correct? You come in with a private orthopedic opinion. You, one of your reasonings for, for, uh, for uh, uh, appealing is, wait a minute, you guys, I was, uh, I was examined 